The Lives of the Saints, by the Rev. Alvin Butler, taken from the 4th edition, published in 1954. August 5th, St. Oswald, King and Martyr. The English Saxon kingdom of the North Umbers was founded by Ida in 547. After his death, the northern part called Bernicia was preserved by his children, but Deira, that is the southern part comprising Yorkshire and Lancashire, was occupied by Aella, or Alla, and after his death was recovered by Ethelfred, grandson of Ida, who ruled the, ruled the whole kingdom of North Umbers 24 years. He being slain in battle by Redwald, king of the East Angles in 617, his sons, Eanfrid, Oswald, and Osfi, took refuge among the Scots, where they were instructed in the Christian faith and received the sacrament of regeneration. In the meantime, Edwin, the son of Allah, reigned 17 years over both kingdoms, but in 633 was killed fighting against the united forces of Penda the Mercian and Cadvala, king of the Britons, or Welch, a Christian by profession, but a stranger to the maxims of his religion in his manners a barbarian and an implacable enemy to the English Saxons. Upon this revolution, the three sons of Ethelfred returned from Scotland, and Ianfred, the eldest, obtained the kingdom of the Dera, whilst Osric, cousin German to Edwin, was chosen king of Bernicia. Both these princes loved the glory of men more than God, and apostatized from the faith which they had embraced, but were both slain the same year by Cadwalla, Osric in battle, and the other soon after by treachery. Hereupon Oswald was called to the crown, both of Dera and Bernicia, he being the son of Ethelfred and nephew of Edwin, whose sister Acca was his mother. This prince had embraced the faith with his whole heart, and far from forsaking Christ as his unhappy brothers had done to court the favor of his subjects, he had no other view than to bring them to the spiritual kingdom of divine grace and to labor with them to secure a crown of eternal glory. At that time, Cadwalla ravaged all the Northumbrian provinces, not as a conqueror, but as a cruel tyrant, laying everything waste with fire and sword at the head of a vast army, which he boasted nothing could resist. Oswald assembled what troops he was able, and being fortified by faith in Christ, marched confidently, though with a small force, against this mighty enemy, who had by that time proceeded as far as the Picts' Wall. Oswald gave him battle at a place called, by Bede, Denisburn, that is, the brook Dennis, adjoining to the Picts' wall on the north side. Being come near the enemy's camp the evening before the engagement, the pious king caused a great wooden cross to be made in haste, and he held it up himself with both his hands, whilst the hole dug in the earth to plant it in was filled up around the foot. When it was fixed, St. Oswald cried out to his army, let us now kneel down and jointly pray to the omnipotent and only true God that he would mercifully defend us from our proud enemy. For he knows that we might that we fight in a just war in defense of our lives and country. All the soldiers did as he commanded them. The place where his cross was set up was called, in the English tongue, Heavenfelth, that is, Heaven's Field, by a happy omen, says Bede, because there was to be erected the first heavenly trophy of faith. For before that time, no church or altar was known to have been raised in the whole kingdom of the Bernicians. This cross of St. Oswald remained afterwards very famous. Bede tells us that to this time many cut little chips of it, and they steeped in water, which being drank by sick persons or sprinkled upon them, many recovered their health. He adds that after the death of King Oswald, the monks of Hexham used to come to the place on the day before the anniversary of his death, there to watch the night in prayer, reciting the office with many psalms for his soul, and the next morning to offer the victim of the holy oblation. A church was built on the spot some time before Bede wrote, who mentions that one of the monks of Hexham, named Botham, then living, having broke his arm by falling on the ice as he was walking in the night, and having suffered a long time much anguish from the hurt, was perfectly cured in one night by applying a little of the moss which was taken off from his cross and brought him. The learned Alcuin, in his poem on the bishops and saints of York, published by Mr. Thomas Gale at Oxford, relates how the pious king, no ways daunted at the multitude and ferocity of his enemies, encouraged his soldiers to a confidence in Christ, and exhorted them to implore his protection prostrate with him on their faces before the cross which he had set up. The author likewise adds an account of several miracles wrought down to this time in 780 at the relics of St. Oswald, and at this cross, or by chips cut from it, infused in water by drinking which many sick were cured, even in Ireland and other distant countries. 
So great was the veneration of the people for this cross that the Abbey of Durham used for its seal during several ages this cross on one side and on the reverse the figure of St. Oswald's head. As Mr. Smith exhibits it from several ancient records, Almighty God was pleased to bless this king's faith and devotion by granting him and his small army a complete victory over Kadwalla, who was killed in the battle, and his forces, with those of his allies, entirely routed. St. Oswald, after giving thanks to God, immediately set himself to restore good order throughout his dominions and to plant in them the faith of Christ. By his ambassadors, he entreated the king and bishops in Scotland to send him a bishop and assistance by whose preaching the people whom he governed might be grounded in the Christian religion and receive baptism. Aidan, a native of Ireland and a monk of the celebrated monastery of Heesh, was chosen for the great and arduous undertaking, and by his mildness soon repaired the mischief done by another monk sent thither before him, whose harshness had alienated many from the sweet law of the gospel. The king bestowed on Aidan the Isle of Lindisfarne for his episcopal seat, and was so edified with his learning and zeal that this great prince, before the bishop could sufficiently speak the English language, would be himself his interpreter and explain his sermons and instructions to the people. Oswald filled his dominions with churches and monasteries, and whilst he was governing his temporal kingdom was intent only to labor and pray for an eternal crown. He very often continued in prayer from the time of matins at midnight to which he rose with the monks till daylight, and by reason of his frequent custom of praying or giving thanks to our Lord at all times, it is said that, wherever he was sitting, he would have his hands on his knees, turned upwards towards heaven. Bede says that he reigned over Britons, Picts, Scots, and English. Wonderful was the humility, affability, and charity of this great king amidst his prosperity, of which Bede gives us the following instance. One Easter day, whilst he was sitting down to dinner, an officer whose business it was to take care of the poor came in and told him there was a great multitude of poor people at his gate desiring alms. Whereupon the king sent them a large di silver dish full of meat from his own table and ordered the dish to be broken into small pieces and distributed among them. Upon this St. Aidan, who happened to be at table, taking him by the right hand, said, Let this hand never corrupt. Bede adds that this arm being cut off from his body after he was slain remained uncorrupt till this time, and was then kept being honored by all with due veneration in the church of St. Peter at the royal castle of Bebeboro, so called from Beba, a former queen, now Bambra, in Northumberland. Simon of Durham and Ingolfus testify that this arm was afterwards kept at Piro Peterborough. When St. Oswald had reigned eight years in great prosperity, Penda, the barbarous pagan king of Mercia, who nine years before had slain the pious king Edwin, uncled St. Oswald by his mother, but had been vanquished by our saint in the beginning of his reign, found means again to raise a great army and invade the Christian dominions of our holy king. St. Oswald met him with an inferior force and was killed in the battle that was fought between them. When he saw himself surrounded with the arms of his enemies, he offered his prayers for the souls of his soldiers. Whence it became a proverb, O God, be merciful to their souls, said Oswald when he fell. He was slain in the thirty-eighth year of his age, of our Lord 642, on the 5th of August, in a place called Masterfield. This seems to have been at Winwick in Lancashire, where is a well still called St. Oswald's, which was formerly visited out of devotion, and at this territory was called Masterfelt, appears from an old inscription in Winwick Church. Nevertheless, Oswaldry, that is Oswald's Cross, a market town seven miles from Shrewsbury, is supposed by some to have also been formerly called Masterfelth, and Capgrave, Camden, and others think this the place where St. Oswald was slain, for he might before this say they, when he defeated Penda, have added that part of Shropshire for his kingdom. The famous church of St. Oswald there stands without the new gate. Leland, in his itinerary, says it was once a monastery. This must have been in the Saxon times, but soon after the Norman conquest, this church of Oswaldry, or Oswald's Cross, was a parish when it was given to the monastery of Shrewsbury, to which it afterwards belonged and was impropriate. C. Tanner, in his monast monastic history, who says the town called Album Monasterium, or White Minster, was not Oswaldry, but Whitchurch, which was once a monastery. The church of Oswaldry was probably so called from St. Oswald's Cross, of which it was probably possessed. But Winwick in Masterfelt in Lancashire more justly claims the honor of his martyrdom. The inhuman tyrant caused the saint's head and arms to be struck off and fixed on poles. But St. Oswald's brother and successor Oswy took them away the year following, and carried the arms to his royal palace and sent the head to Lindisfarne. 
The head was afterwards put in the same shrine with the body of St. Cuthbert and with it translated to Durham, as Malmesbury and others assure us. The rest of St. Oswald's body was translated by his niece Alfreda, wife of Ethelred, King of Mercia, to the monastery of Bardney in Lincolnshire. During the Danish eruptions, these relics were removed by the care of Ethelred, King of the Mercians, to Gloucester, where Alfreda, Countess of Mercia and daughter to King Alfred, built the Church of St. Peter. The monument erected to St. Oswald there is still to be seen in a chapel of this cathedral between two pillars, but part of the relics were translated to the Abbey of St. Winnexberg in Flanders in 1221 and deposited there with great solemnity by Adam, Bishop of Teruan. The barbarous King Penda, after he had slain five pious kings, Edwin, Oswald, Sigebert, Egric, and Annas, turned his arms against Oswy, who tried in vain to soften him by presence in the most favorable proposals. Seeing himself rejected by man, he turned his gifts into prayers and bound himself by vow in case he should be victorious to consecrate to God his daughter Eflenda, then only one year old, and give with her twelve portions of land, each of which was sufficient to maintain ten families, to build and endow monasteries. God heard his vow, and Oswy, with an inferior army, defeated and slew the tyrant near Leuden, now Leeds in Yorkshire, in 655. The place of this battle was called Wind. Winwildfield, Winwidfield, or Field of Victory, situated on the river Winwad, now Eyre, with Penda, who was then 80 years old, in which he had reigned 30, fell 30 commanders of royal blood.